we are very happy uh, to have you here and that you talk about piggybacking. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> uh, Forrest, welcome to Kiel. Uh, thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody, you can hear me? Good. In the back? Good. Okay. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through some of our old stuff and then hopefully into some of the new stuff with the ideas of giving everybody that hasn't, doesn't know the work some background and then hopefully new things for people that do know some of it. And the idea is going to be really um, how we think it's been really nice because most places you go, it's not only do they not know anything about phages, but they also uh, don't know anything about temperate phage at all. And this is really a temperate phage and how we're thinking about temperate phage for the most part. So we, we use this term piggyback the winner, which to describe the ecological dynamic that we're observing in a lot of systems, um, where as you get to higher host densities, you see this really, uh, this massive increase in lysogeny. So if you're in a really dense uh, uh, microbial community, almost, well, essentially all of the bacteria will carry prophage and usually multiple prophage. And we've been through this, so um, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time, um, but the last speaker did a very good job of pointing out that when you're in this, when you're a prophage and you're forming a lysogen, your uh, survival is totally changed. You, one, have to battle with other phage to keep this guy alive, right? So you have to keep this cell alive. And you have to not get killed off by protus because that's going to be your two major uh, predator guilds out there. So the first thing I'm going to do is take you through two things about how this influences human health. And it's going to be what we call BAM immunity. And I'm going to talk a little bit about transcytosis. And it really comes from my days as an immunologist, really thinking about, so at the time, all we did was adaptive immune responses, right? So T cells and B cells, and uh, how do they protect a cell? And really for our, an organism, and for the most part, real adaption um, in that context doesn't really start until you get into like the elasma brinks. So you have to get pretty high up into uh, the tree of life. But then you've got the rest of the tree of life. And we're gonna, I'm going to take you through how we think the phage might be the origin of the specific immune response. The starting point, of course, is the mucus, because every, uh, all of the animals, as you go up through cnidarians, um, have mucus. And what's interesting about mucus is that it's basically a combinatorial chemistry uh, barrier, where you take and you make these large... Uh, proteins, and then you start adding different glycosylation patterns to them. So you add some stuff, you clip off some stuff. And because of how this happens, and because you get different enzymes from your different parents, everybody has different mucus, right? And so you end up with these weird glycosylation patterns. Everybody's mucus is different. And the other thing that's kind of cool about them is that there's some of them are embedded into the cell uh, membrane. And then you have another set that sits up and is unattached. And that's what keeps getting pushed off all the time. And that's what your cilia are doing. So they're pushing off the mucus. And that's the stuff that uh, you swallow or spit out. And this covers uh, all, uh, your respiratory tract, your gastrointestinal, et cetera. And it's really the largest surface um, exposed to the environment, much bigger than your skin. In things like corals, that's all they have is mucosal membranes that are exposed to the environment. So one of the early uh, observations we had is that we had been working, we work on corals a lot, and we would be sampling the coral, we would suck the mucus off the coral, and then we would take a sample of the water and we would just count the number of bacteria and the number of viruses using direct counts, all those little speckles you guys saw earlier. And there's kind of this rule in microbial ecology, it's not completely true, but there are about 10 virus-like particles, most of which are phage, for every microbial cell out there. The difference is, is when you actually go and look at mucosal surfaces, so this is the mucus, this is the water surrounding the sea anemone, for example, you find that you get have about 40 phage for every microbial cell on the mucus and about the 10 
to one that we normally see everywhere else. And why this is important is if you think about the phage trying to run into the bacteria, it's for the most part mass action driven. So if you push up these relative concentrations, you get more interactions. So this would change the mass action interaction thing. So we started looking, are we actually getting the phage to bind to the mucus? And this is just an example of one of these experiments. You can take like a Petri dish, you can lay down mucins or DNA or protein as kind of controls, wash some th phage across it, uh, let it incubate for a little bit, wash away anything that didn't stick to the plate, and then layer on top the host, in this case E. coli, and then just incubate it and look for plaques. So all these are where you had phages um, that killed the bacteria. And when you do things like this, what we find is that the number of adherent phage goes uh, up only when you have the mucins there. So there's something about the mucins that are doing this. We can also do it in tissue culture where we have plus or minus mucus and we get the same answer. Yeah. The other thing about this is that those uh, phage are actually active. So in this case, we have tissue culture cells with and without mucus. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna wash in the T4 phages. We're gonna uh, overlay them uh, after some time with E. coli, and then we're just gonna calculate, uh, see how many uh, phage and bacteria are there. This is where we plotted the number of bacteria. This is a cell line that produces mucus, and in this case, you can see that when we have the phage, the number of bacteria go down because they're being killed off by the, uh, by the phage. If we uh, actually don't treat with the phage, we don't get the killing, of course. And then you can knock this down. You can take out, uh, use uh, knockdowns to get rid of the muck genes, and you lose that effect. So there is something about the mucus that the phage is uh, attached to. So this is in the terminology of immunology. It's an acquired immune system. So it's something that you're not born with, but you get later on. So any, any microbial community that comes into an epithelial surface, if there's, uh, we, and this becomes important in a little bit, if the phage are sticking to this mucosal surface, that's going to change the dynamics at this layer right here, and you'll get more bacterial killing. And that could be driven by non-specific things like just isoelectric interactions. It would also be driven by fluid dynamics because remember whenever you have a fluid going across, if it's moving at this speed, it'll be much slower here. So you get accumulation in this area. So there's something about, there's many ways that you could get this to happen. So is it a specific or a non-specific effect? And this I think is really fun. So this is the T4 phage again. And what T4 has are all these uh, little nubs sticking out. So it has 150 of these immunoglobulin-like proteins that stick out of its capsid. And they're called Hawk domains. You guys probably know them because they're what you use in phage display or something like them. Different phage display systems uh, use things like this. And we, believe, we hypothesize that the mucus uh, binding capabilities of the phage was driven through these things right here. And the reason was because of this observation by Rick Bushman's group. So Rick had been doing deep sequencing of uh, the microbes of people, or sorry, the uh, viruses of uh, uh, fecal matter. And what they found is that you have, so everybody in this room has a unique group of phage that are living in your guts, okay? But more importantly, you actually have thousands of different copies of a particular locus in those phage, and that's these hawk like domains, so these uh, immunoglobulin-like things. And we know that these are really cool because they, uh, they keep all of this massive sequence variation um, through a hypervariability, uh, a, a targeted hypervariability mechanism. And so these are these DGRs. Um, it's based on reverse transcription, and you can get something like 10 to the 13th potential alternatives in that Hawk domain. So these are completely different uh, things. And we also know that um, these things are dispensable for phage growth in the lab. So there must be something that's cool about them. The other thing is, is if you're uh, familiar with immunology, there 
immunoglobulin-like, and this is what we always associate with the hypervariability of the TCRs and the, B uh, the antibodies in the B cells. So it's very suspicious. All right, so the nice thing about phage is you can get all the mutants. So in this case, we take the T4 phage, and we have plus or minus the Hawk domain, and we're gonna just do that same experiment that we did before. We'll have plus and minus Hawk domain. We'll put it on plates with and without mucus, and we'll just ask where did they stick, and they only stick to uh, when they have the Hawk domain and there's mucin there. Otherwise, they can't stick to the mucins. So this is some sort of specific association. This is why, so that's actually a acquired system. You have to think of the germ layer being the bacteria instead of the microbiome rather than being your own cells. It's adaptive because it's, uh, everybody, it's, uh, it, everybody has different mucus, which is selecting for different phage to stick to it through this hyper uh, selection on this hyper variable regions. And it's specific because of course, phage are pretty good about only killing a certain set of bacteria. Now, it's a really complicated system and it makes it harder to study um, because you actually have the mucus being produced. Remember, I was telling you the mucus comes up and then it gets shunted away. So you have the mucus production rates, you have the growth rates of the bacteria, and then you have the phage growing in the system and sticking at a certain rate. So the way we look at it, um, one of our favorites is actually just use microfluidic systems where you lay down a mucus, uh, mucus producing cells, then you seed this with phage and with bacteria, et cetera. And then you measure the relative abundances of bacteria and phage over time. And we use that to parameterize models like this. Um, I'm not gonna torture anybody with this. I, I know we have some math people, but nobody cares about math. So we'll just skip that and we'll go to this. So the take home message of why it works is this, that if you, um, if you're, a, if you're a phage, this is a good place to hunt, right? Because really you've taken a uh, three-dimensional problem and turned it into a two-dimensional problem because they're living in this particular area, which means that you're much more likely to find a host. Okay? If you're a bacteria, it kind of sucks because you're more likely to run into the phage as you go in towards the, uh, towards the epithelial layer. So you can think of it as a reef of phage sitting there. This gets more complicated and I'm not gonna go through all the details, but really important given what people were talking about today is that this really reinforces the microbiome because your microbiome is the source of the phage that are sticking here, okay? And they're actually not being killed because of superfection exclusion, right? So they're safe, but any related uh, bacteria that comes in runs into this phage wall. And if you put this together with that piggyback the winner dynamic that I was talking about, this is how we, uh, well, we have some uh, pretty good evidence of how this is working. So you can imagine these are the, uh, uh, the mucus is being produced and being pushed out this way. And you just end up with this gradation of like basically 0% mucus down to about 5% mucus. The phage are preferentially living right about here at about 1% mucus uh, in relative concentrations. And what happens is that when you're out in that lumen where you have that 10 to one uh, microbial uh, uh, interaction sort of stuff going on, lysogeny isn't helping a lot. Uh, or sorry, that's where lysogeny helps. <laughs> and then as you get down into this stuff, they actually start spontaneously uh, inducing and you get lysis of anything that makes it down here. And that's how you get the phage living down in here. So really, uh, we and we've shown this pretty well nowadays, is that when you're in the lumen, you, uh, you really get uh, the hunting of the phage is, it doesn't, get it, the BAM domains don't help you. When you get down into that uh, lower, into that mucus at about 1%, that's when the BAM domains help you find a host effectively. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so what we expect is that any surface to have this, okay. Remember, you don't need all the specificity because you can get it out of uh, hydrodynamics and stuff, but the, we do expect to find solute, uh, different BAM-like domains living on phage. 
So what about inside the body? So I've told you, here's the surfaces, but of course, bacteria, you get sepsis and so forth. And one of the things we've noticed over the years is that whenever we take like blood or we take uh, cerebral spinal fluid out of uh, healthy people, we find a lot of phage in them. So we find eukaryotic or viruses that infect the eukaryotes, but we also find a lot of phage. And the, the supposition was that, you know, it's like when you brush your teeth, you just push some in through your gums and they get into your blood. But we started looking at this directly for a different reason. And um, what we did in these cases is that we would uh, put uh, cells, this is a tissue culture line, that will polarize into these trans well systems. And so they form uh, uh, a monolayer here. And then you put phage in this side and you look for them to come out on this side, or you put them here and you look at them to come out here. And when you do this, what you find is that they're going across these epithe or this single cell layer and they're only doing it in one direction. So they're only moving apical to basal. So that would be like you're moving from the lumen into the blood or into the lymph in particular, which is important. And we find that about 0.1% uh, of the phage that we add up here ends up here. And the reason is, is that we get about a 1% uh, take up here and then we, about 10% makes it all the way across. The Types of cells, the eukaryotic cells, doesn't matter. If, they're if they can be polarized, they'll do this. So it doesn't matter whether the kidney or gut or liver, et cetera. As long as you can get them to form those sorts of layers, they'll translocate uh, the phage. It looks to be nonspecific. It doesn't look like there's a receptor because of uh, the kinetics of it. So this is just an example. It doesn't matter how many phage we add here, you get basically the same movement over time. Nothing that gives us a feeling of it being specific and all our cell biology says that there's some non-specific mechanism by which this is happening. Um, the other thing is, is that you can take any phage type, so these are the main, uh, the main groups, the podos, the myos, and the sypos, and you can do the same sort of thing and all of them get uh, transcytosed, uh, and they do it about the same frequency, and it doesn't really matter whether they have the Hawk domain or not, which is what we were originally looking for, so that part failed. Okay. And it's not just dependent on LPS, because one of the things that you could imagine is that the uh, lipopolysaccharide would hold on to the phage, and then the cells would pull in the LPS, which would then pull in the phage, and that's how it would work. Um, it doesn't matter. This is just uh, different levels of uh, LPS where we look for transcytosis, and we still get this. So what does this actually mean? So given what we've measured both in the blood as well as the rates that we're measuring and the, the relative abundances, we think that there's something like about 30 billion phage transcytosis events from your gut into your blood every day. Okay, so you've got all these phage and they're being cleared in about six to 12 hours. Okay. To give you a fill, you actually have about 30 billion white blood cells. So the number of phage you have versus the number of total white blood cells you have are about equal. Okay. So what we think is, is that they're constantly moving through the lymph and the blood and serving as something that's an acquired systemic immune system also. Okay. Now there's one immunology point here that's really fun for anybody that likes immunology. The way that you tolerate yourself, so there's this thing about phage, we don't mount an immune response to them. So they're big, you would think we would just have an immune response. And if I take and I jab you with a set of phage, you'll get a nasty immune response to it. So if I give you an adjuvant, so something that stimulates the immune system plus the phage, you mount a really nice one. So why are we not mounting an immune response to these things? And we think it's probably because of this mechanism here. You're pulling them in, you're putting them in the lymph, and the lymph goes right to the lymph nodes, and that's where tolerization happens. So if you can get something to the lymph nodes without a danger signal like LPS, you get tolerization. Okay? So we think that this is going on in at probably animals across the board. We expect to find this sort of things in all the, in any surface, including animals, I mean, sorry, including things like plants and, uh, and microbial and so forth. 
We know that it uh, is one of the important things for uh, it creates a feedback system that individualizes the microbiome. And we think that it's important for actually protecting uh, not just animals that don't have T cells and B cells, uh, us as well as those guys. So phage can protect uh, holobionts from invading bacteria. But then there's the flip side. So we've heard about this a little bit. And that's how phage actually go about killing animals. And we'll go to my favorite system, which are coral reefs. So those of you that aren't so familiar with them, remember that when you've got a, a, a nice, healthy coral reef system, you've got the corals, which are building a, most of the structure. You have these things, which are called coral and crestose algae, which are cementing it together. So that's how you build these structures, these two things together, so the calcifiers. And you have very little algae. So most primary production is actually done by these guys or the algae, the zooxanthellae that live inside the corals. And that becomes important in a second. The reason is, is because you have these massive grazing communities. So sitting on a coral reef, if you start to grow as a turf algae, you get grazed immediately. And if you've ever been on one that has a lot of grazing, you really can't see the turf algae, which are kind of slime layers, because they're hammered all the time. So it's almost white and they're kind of, uh, as soon as they grow up, they get eaten. And these things are eating so much because they're dying so quickly, because they get eaten by these big things here. So you get this movement of photosynthesis all the way through, and you're just producing sharks and groupers the whole time. These guys die young. These guys live a long time. What that means is that on the coral surface, in particular where we know it the best, the way that the bacteria that live in that mucosal membrane get their energy is through the mucins that are fed to it via the coral. That allows them to regulate the amount of energy to uh, that the bacteria that get, live on the coral get. All right, so then we have people. And what people do is we go and eat all of those big things, right? Because they're so tasty. So this is uh, the Hawaiian Islands, for example. This is the places where we don't have people. And this is the places that we have people, right? And this is across the world, right? So the only places where uh, you have really big fish left are places where people have a really hard time getting to, or they're protected strongly. And this is everywhere. Places like the Caribbean, you're hard pressed to see a big grouper or a shark, to tell you the truth. So we've been lucky to study a lot of these remote regions, which allows you to compare uh, the pristine versus the non-pristine systems. And what I'm gonna show you is the geochemistry, and it comes back to the viruses, trust me. <laughs> I just have to go through a step. So what happens in these systems? We remove this energy shunt. These things stop turning over as quickly, right? So we don't get that, the, the trophic uh, transfer where we lose energy, which means that these things start growing. They feed the bacteria, dissolved organic carbon, just think of it as sugar, and the dissolved organic carbon, uh, you get more microbes which come back and kill the corals, which I'll show you why, which then creates more space, which creates more dissolved organic carbon, and you get in a positive feedback, and the system falls apart in a matter of a couple years, right? So it's this positive feedback that's important. We call this microbialization because it's the shunting of energy away from the big things to the small things. This is our, uh, our methods for looking at them. So for the most part, we go out, we collect water underwater, and then we count the microbes and we measure the amount of dissolved organic carbon. Again, the sugars. We collect the boundary layers um, uh, by sucking it up with uh, these pumps and bringing it up and do metagenomic sequencing on the viruses and the bacteria. And then we, of course, get the benthic surveys when we count how much uh, coral is on the bottom and the fish. And Nowadays, we have really large data sets. So two or, th uh, this is almost like 300 sites nowadays where we have all of the same data types, which gives you a lot more power to look into it. And the take home message is that microbialization, remember that shifting of energy away from the big things to the small things is global. It's happening everywhere on the, uh, the planet. Um, this is just, remember I showed you Hawaii, like where everything gets fish. So Oahu's way up there. Um, down here is, uh, these are some of the most pristine American protectorates. 
And this is what we call the microbialization score. It's just a measure of how much energy is going into those two, uh, the fish or the bacteria on a, on a coral reef. And what you can see is that someplace like Oahu, all of the energy basically goes to feed bacteria. On some place where you're, it's a nice pristine reef, you're actually mostly feeding fish. Now we're sequencing the bacteria in these systems and we can ask what's happening as the amount of algae is changing uh, on the bottom versus what's going on with the bacteria. And we see something that you would kind of, ex uh, well, sorry, something that um, is fairly easy to catch, which is that as you get more algae, so kind of the green here, you see this increase in the gamma proteobacters, which, and the ones that are in particular related to your, uh, your potential pathogens. So like Vibrio, uh, E. coli, and Schuonella sorts of things. And that's very different than like these open water help pristine systems, which have more like SAR-11 and so forth in them. But more importantly, from the viral point of view is this. As you get, um, as you move from nice reefs here to degraded reefs here, you see a switch from glycolysis-based pathways to pentose phosphate pathways and things of this nature. And nobody wants to remember physiology, so I'll just put this up here. So remember, glycolysis, if I go through the glycolysis from sugar all the way down to, uh, all the way through the TCA cycle, I produce something like 34 to 38 ATP, depending on how you want to calculate it. However, if I use the pentose phosphate pathway, I produce almost no ATP, but I produce things like NADPH, so things that are, uh, allow me to build cell mass and so forth. So this is energy inefficient, this is efficient, this is what we call catabolic me uh, metabolisms and anabolic metabolisms. This is a, a shift, so what these guys are trying to do is they're trying to squeeze as much energy out of the uh, sugar as possible, these guys are just trying to build things as quickly as possible. What happens across all of these coral reefs is that you see this increase in the microbial biomass, but more importantly, this is uh, one of the enzymes that can tell you which, uh, what is going on between anabolic and catabolic uh, mechanisms. And you can see as we increase the fleshy algae, we actually see the increase in the things associated with the anabolic mechanism. And we kind of know what this is. It's mostly a physical oceanography thing, which is what we call the bubble hypothesis. Okay. So imagine that you take and you put corals and algae in little bottles, and we call them pop, uh, you know, like soda pop, because that's actually what we're using. So we have little corals in this thing. And then we measure to see how much oxygen is produced and where the oxygen goes to. So when we're doing photosynthesis, we're going to produce sugar and we're going to produce um, uh, uh, oxygen. And some of that oxygen can come out of solution and form uh, gas. And so what we see is that in places uh, where you have, or sorry, with corals and that coral and crustless algae and these turf algaes, we get um, uh, very little loss of oxygen as gas. So it doesn't bubble out of the system. But when we have the bigger algaes, we get all of this oxygen being lost out of the system. And it's quite a bit. It's probably about 20% of the oxygen relative to this is lost as, uh, as gas. Okay. So why is this important? Well, imagine that you're trying to degrade uh, the sugar. You need, that you need the oxygen as your ultimate electron source. The algae is letting it bubble off and we're losing it. Okay? Whereas in the coral system, they actually, the holobiont keeps the oxygen uh, in the system because you've got the algae living in the animal. So the animal is grabbing the oxygen and using it. So these guys recycle it. These guys are losing it. You can see it in a variety of ways. You can even hear it because of the bubbles with a hydrophone. Okay? And this goes back to the coral reef, uh, I'm sorry, to the, the viruses. So what's happening on a healthy reef is that they have basically a low carbon supply relative to the amount of oxygen that they can send things to. So what they do is they use these very complicated 
uh, catabolic pathways that produce high ATP, which is what I showed you, right? Which changes the ATP to AMP ratio in such a way that you favor the lytic cycle of the phages. Does that sound good? In this case, when you've got less oxygen, so you have effectively extra sugar, you can think of it that way. Since they're not worried about using sugar, what they do is they go through these anabolic uh, pathways, which produce less ATP compared to, so you, your ratio switch hits here, so you get increased cyclic AMP, which is what uh, drives, the, in the case of the lambda switch at least, integrase expression and, and the virul or sorry, the integration of the phage. You guys with me? Okay. All right. So what we know is that the temperate life cycle with the phage should be varied, uh, should actually be favored under these anabolic decoupled conditions. Okay. All right. So why? Well, Remember, if you're a bacteria, and in particular, if you're lysogen, you're getting wiped out by phage and by protus. So if you're a prophage, you're going to have to protect against those groups. And the main way that you protect yourself against protus is that you have to carry around virulence factors. So we call them virulence factors because they cause diseases in humans, but they're actually things that target the central metabolism things in eukaryotes. So exotoxins are the ones that we prefer because we just happen to know a lot about them. But you can think of exotoxins and other virulence factors are things that kill eukaryotic cells, including the protus. So this is a, how the dynamic looks, and this is how it varies from the classical uh, view of just the lytic phages. Normally, you would have the dissolved organic matter pool, which is feeding the heterotrophic bacteria, and about half of these are being killed off by the phage, and about half of them are being killed uh, off by protus. That's what we call, this part is what we call the viral shunt. We've heard a little bit about it, this. And this is actually driven by about 10 phage per uh, uh, cell. That's the rough numbers. And this is what is called kill the winner dynamics. And for the uh, classical ecologists, it's just a lock of Volterra sort of model. So you just have these two uh, things running together. And you can imagine that uh, what happens is bacteria one comes abundant and then virus one comes along and kills it, which creates a niche space so bacteria two can come in and it gets killed off. So you're just in this, this running thing. These are mass action driven, right? This is just how often things are going to run into each other. Okay. And what you expect with the mass action driven stuff is that as you get more microbes and more viruses, so if you're going along this axis and this axis, what you would expect is that you get more interactions and you're gonna get this switch where you get a lot more viruses compared to the number of microbes as they run into each other. And we all know this because we've all done it in the lab or any phage person has, because you can add phage at a certain concentration and get them to lyse everything there. Right, so you can get this to happen. That's not what we're actually observing on the, the reefs. So again, we're gonna go out, we're gonna gather the samples from all those reefs. We're gonna uh, count everything, plot this on, the, uh, on this, uh, this graph where we have microbes going along here, viruses going along here. These are your degraded reefs because this is where we have more uh, viruses, I mean, more bacteria. And what you can see is that the unity line of one to one which we would expect it to even be higher than that, they don't make it. So these, we're getting less viral production even though we have more hosts. Is that good? And we've probably been misled because of all our emphasis on marine microbiology. Because marine microbe systems sit right here at about 10 microbes per mil in every system. This is where we've just graphed all of the direct counts from a whole bunch of ecosystems. Okay, so we have literally thousands of different data points sitting here from about 20 different ecosystems. And what I want you to notice is that as I move up this direction, the number of viruses, so this is the virus to microbe ratio, decreases dramatically. So we see fewer and fewer microbes actually there. 
uh, uh, viruses for every microbial cell. So that 10 to 1 goes away as we increase the number of microbes. And that's indicative of lysogeny. The one way that you could get around this is you could increase diversity. So imagine things are running to, into each other more often. So there, there's two possibilities, right? So there's some other mechanism that we don't know about, which will be, I'll show you, it was mostly lysogeny. But you could imagine that you just increase the number of species so that you just have fewer interacting pairs going on in the system. That isn't what we observe. So again, here's the number of microbes per mil, and this is whether, uh, in this case, whether we, the number of species that we see in the microbial uh, community, that actually goes down as the reefs degrade. So we're getting more and more of the gamma proteos, but overall the diversity has decreased. And if we look at things like CRISPRs or restriction enzymes or whatever the antiphage mechanisms, they also tend to go down as we increase the number of bacteria. All right, what does go up are the number of integrases and excises. So again, we are looking at metagenomic data. We're just asking how often do we see integrase, so the enzyme that helps the prophage get into the, uh, or uh, integrates into the host genome. And excise is used by a mini phage to get back out. And what we see is that as we increase the number of uh, uh, bacteria along this axis, we see an increase in the number of integrase and excise genes. Okay. And then finally, if we look in the, the same systems using the same sort of methods and we just ask how often do you see the uh, virulence genes, it's the same sort of thing is that we're getting an increase in the number of, uh, as we increase the bacteria, we see an increase in the number of uh, virulence genes. So we're doing studies now to show that the prophage are actually protecting from the protists. I mean, there's some like classical studies, but not like in the uh, big environmental level. So we're looking at this. And what this means is that our version of what we're calling coral diseases, we are actually not seeing something that's specific coral pathogens in these systems where the corals are dying. We're actually seeing the emergence of pathogens in the in um, the system because of the uh, acquisition of prophage. So coral disease is actually an emergent property which matches our epidemiology data too. Okay. So the take home message from this is that really overfishing has switched the system um, such that we don't have a uh, good coupling between the oxygen and the sugars and that allows this microbialization state to come into play. The only way that the microbes can survive in that, because they're at increased numbers, is to have a prophage, which protect them from other phage and protects them from protists. And so you get diseases as an emergent property. All right, this is the, the last bit. This is only for, I know there are some modelers here. So this is, if you take all of the data, we've been looking to see what happens if we have a lock of Volterra model versus one that incorporates uh, some sort of temperate switch where we've got lysogeny. And this is our, our real data going along here. This is what we get out of a lock of Volterra model. And you can see that we get mostly all the, the, the reason those are so dark in the real data is because that's all the uh, marine stuff where we have most of the sampling. And that's mostly what we see is that open ocean uh, counts match very much lytic sort of behavior. If we do a purely lysogenic world, we get something that kind of looks like that. But if we put them together, we get things like this, where this is the real data here, and this is what we're getting out of the models. And they're almost identical. So you have to have some, uh, you have lytic behavior at these lower concentrations, you have temperate behavior at the, uh, at the higher concentrations, and the models capture that really well now. And with that, I'll thank, there's a ton of people, of course, involved in this. Um, in particular, though, uh, Jeremy Barr and Sean and Sophie, uh, Natasha and Rita did all of the work on um, the, the uh, phage, uh, the BAM models and so forth, and the transcytosis. And it's uh, Cynthia 
and Ben have done most of the work on the piggyback, the winter dynamics on coral reefs and, and in other systems. Modeling was done by this group, mostly this group uh, with a couple other helpers. Um, the Anka Segal is here somewhere. Hi, Anka's here. She works with me a lot. Um, Joe and uh, Joe Poliano's lab and Kelly Duran's lab helped a lot with uh, the, those uh, microfluidic systems and how to build them along with Sam Kucinich. Jeff Gordon's lab um, is where we do lots of the human gut stuff. And then uh, these guys were the ones that helped with a lot of the transcytosis. And then these are the people that paid for it. And I'll take... <laughs>